Hello, I'm Brian Goulet of the Goulet Pen Company and Ink Nouveau, and this is episode 12 of Goulet Q&A. Today is kind of an interesting one because I had a topic for last week, which was using your fountain pens, and I ended up getting so many questions and kind of split into naturally into two different topics. So I kept using your fountain pens for last week, and now this week I'm doing troubleshooting your fountain pens because I got so many questions about leaking and troubleshooting and that kind of stuff that I thought it warranted its own topic. I didn't solicit a lot of extra questions. I know there are a lot of troubleshooting video topics out there, but I just thought of the questions I've already gotten, I'll go ahead and break this into it. I could easily see doing like a troubleshooting your fountain pens part two, part three, part five, part 12. You know, I could see this being a lot of future topics, but anyway, I did want to stick to the questions that I originally gotten for this week. That's why I didn't go crazy trying to get more questions, but certainly I know there will be more, especially after I post this video, but that's totally cool. So I'm not using that to time anything specifically. I just like flipping it and looking at it. I think it's cool. Anyway, so I got a bunch of questions here. Uh, I'm gonna try and answer them as best I can. Now I will kind of give myself a little bit of breathing room here and say when it comes to troubleshooting pens, it can really be hard when I get a single sentence about your situation and I'm trying to give you advice on it. I have to speak in generalities. Sometimes even when I get a back and forth over email or something like that or in a live chat, it can be hard to troubleshoot because I'm not there. I'm not seeing exactly what's happening. I have to ask a lot of different questions. So there can definitely be some things that I may may or may not seem like I know what I'm talking about. So you just have to kind of take that into account that I'm using the best information what I have, the best that I'm able to get it across. So please forgive me a little bit if I don't completely nail 100% every single one of these questions. So that said, I'll give, I'll give it my best shot. Kathy M on Facebook started out by saying, how much ink evaporation is normal? When should we start looking at the integrity of the seals? Uh, so I didn't know if you were specifically, Kathy, I didn't know if you were asking about evaporation in a, in a bottle of ink or in a pen. I think you were talking about in a pen. Uh, however, I will say that ink evaporation is not something that happens quickly in a bottle. Most bottles of ink are made to last several years without evaporating to a great degree. Now that said, you got to make sure they're screwed on tightly. And if there is ink that kind of builds up around the top, it kind of crusts up there. You got to clean that stuff off. Otherwise, it's not going to seal as tightly. So just watch out for that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, over time, though, it will, you know, especially if it's in a plastic bottle, it's definitely going to leach uh, out of that. And then if it's in, you know, just a conventional glass ink bottle, it's going to, over time, want to evaporate. So um, most inks that are, especially ones that are dye-based, can be reconstituted with distilled water. Uh, so you can add water back in there and get it back to its natural form. Um, you know, if you've got a 40-year-old bottle of ink, it eh, might be a little tougher to do, but... Generally, you can still do that. I'm not a vintage ink guy myself. I know there's a lot of people out there uh, who like to get really old bottles of ink and then reconstitute them and use them. It's totally legit. You can do that. But anyway, that's not what you asked. I'm getting on, on a tangent here. So, um, okay, how much ink evaporation is normal? If you're talking about in a pen, then it's really going to vary from one pen to another. Uh, you know, pens, uh, and then this was actually kind of backed up by Helen Oh, from my second question, which I'll get to in just a second. Uh, so when should you look at the integrity of the seals? It's kind of generally known that some pens will evaporate ink more than others. Uh, generally speaking, if you have an O-ring or some kind of cap insert, those are what are going to seal up the best. I think about pens like the Platinum Preppy that, you know, you can, it's a clear pen. You can visually see there's an insert in there. Pilot Prayer has got one. The Platinum 3776 Century has uh, great sealing technology in there. Those pens, you're almost not going to have to worry about evaporation at all, really, you know, especially if you're cleaning your pen every month or every two months anyway, you're really not going to have to deal with it too much. Other pens, like, you know, some of the Noodler's pens are known for drying out a little more, especially if it's a pen that's got a really generous ink flow, you know, flex pens uh, generally tend to, to deal with that. Um, you know, that's where Helen O was starting to ask me here in question two, which is they were replied nested under each other on Facebook here. So yes, Kathy asked what I wondered. I put ink in my Ahab, then I didn't use it and picked it up about a week later, empty. Can it disappear like that or is my memory bad? Well, your memory could be bad. Uh, you know, I'm not gonna say that it can't be, but you know, I, I don't know that uh, 
that generally that in evaporates that quickly out of the Ahab, but it wouldn't be completely unusual for a noticeable amount of ink to have evaporated out of, especially in Noodler's pen. Um, they're great pens, but they're meant to be used, you know, pretty regularly. So if you aren't going to be using them for, you know, even a week, uh, it's possible that you could have some evaporation out of there. Uh, now, usually I will, I will only have that kind of issue with like starting issues and I may need to flood the feed a little bit. I haven't had that much ink evaporate out of my pen. There's environmental factors it could be in. If you're in a dry environment with relative humidity that's really dry, um, then the ink will evaporate quicker. What's actually happening is it's water that's in the ink. You've got water, you've got dye, you've got a few other components in there, but those are the main parts. So what's happening is the water is evaporating out of it. It's leaving the dye behind. It's going to be really like concentrated and stuff like that. Dye itself doesn't flow well. So it's going to have a hard time starting, hard time flowing. You know, it's visually, it's going to be appear much, much less. You can reconstitute it with water. And usually if it evaporates that much, you're going to want to clean it out uh, just so that uh, you don't, you know, you, you just get all that gunk out of there and then you can put fresh ink in. Um, keeping in mind, it's not like a huge volume of ink that's in most of these pens. You know, well, the Ahab, you can get up there, especially if you've got an eyedropper, but I don't think it would be that much that would come out of an eyedropper. Anyway, so um, <clears throat> yeah, I would say it's not incredibly unusual. It's definitely on the extreme end of that spectrum uh, there, Helen. Uh, and then for, for Kathy, you know, when should you look at the integrity of the seals? I don't know what to tell you. I mean, I guess if you've got a really old pen, and, you sus and you've had it for a long time and you suspect that, that it's not holding up like it used to, then you could assume that it might be something with the seals and look to get it restored or something like that. Uh, but generally speaking, that kind of stuff isn't gonna, you're not gonna have to worry about that kind of stuff for a long time. That's gonna be more of a design aspect of the pen. So it's kind of like you have to ask other people who have the same pens or maybe post on Fountain Pen Network or something like that, look at reviews and blogs and stuff to see what other people are experiencing and then try and gauge whether your situation is normal or not. Okay, hopefully that helps you out some. Anna W on Facebook said, do pens leak more at high altitude? I live at 5,280 feet and my parent and my pens find my pens dribble into the cap fairly often, even those that never leave my desk. It happens across the board with brands and inks. Um, so I am not at that elevation. I'm just barely above sea level here and just outside of Richmond, Virginia. Uh, so I don't have a lot of experience firsthand, but I did do a little bit of research and I found that um, other people who live at high altitudes said that yes, it is not uncommon for pens to leak ink more at high altitudes, especially if you are changing altitude a lot, even maybe a thousand feet, 2000 feet, uh, that can affect things, especially if you're changing altitude rapidly. Like if you're in a car and you're driving in the mountains or something and changing elevation, that can really make a difference. Um, I think that it tends to be more of an issue when you're going up as opposed to when you're going down, because as you go higher up in elevation, the relative pressure in the air is dropping. So the pressure that's inside your pen is gonna be higher than the surrounding environment and it's gonna to wanna to make ink come out. Um, so some things that you can do to combat that is to keep the pen full of ink because it's the air that's inside the pen that is going to cause you the problem. So water, you know, ink is mostly made of water. That doesn't change pressure. It's only the air that's inside the pen. So if you have the pen full of ink and there's no air in there, you're gonna have a much less likely chance of it leaking out. Um, and also keep the nib pointed up. That's a good rule uh, when you're just traveling pretty much in general, especially if you're going on a plane or anything like that, keep the nib pointed up. That way, if there is any change in pressure, the air will be at the top near the nib and all the ink will be kind of in the bottom and it'll be less likely to have the ink come up through the nib. Hopefully that helps. Michelle B on Facebook says, why does this happen? I've had a couple different cartridge converter pens completely empty the entire converter of ink into the lid or general vicinity overnight. Um, so the first thing you'll wanna do, um, if it's happening in the cap, that's a little bit different. Uh, but if you said general vicinity, if it's like leaking into the body of the pen, then that means that that thing is not seated in there properly. And that's the first thing I would check to make sure you got your cartridge converter actually installed on there all the way. Uh, a lot of pens will actually have it where if you you know screw the pen body on, it'll hold that converter on there. So again, I don't know exactly what pen you're talking about, but uh, that's the first thing I would check. And then the second thing I would say is to try to store that nib up just like, um, 
just like Anna was asking here, you know, at the high elevation, if you're storing the nib up, then it's gonna be much harder for that ink to come out of there because you're gonna have air at the top. And so that's the first thing I would do is if you're having an issue like that, store your nib up and that should pretty much take care of the problem. But um, you may be dealing with some pressure stuff, you know, um, you may, Gosh, I'm trying to think what else, but if, if you're carrying around the pen, you said generally in, overnight, you're probably not carrying it anywhere. If you're carrying the pen around and the pen's moving back and forth, sometimes ink can get kind of shaken out of there or stirred up and kind of mixed out into there. Um, but you know, without knowing exactly what kind of pen, it's tough for me to say exactly what's causing it, but those are some a couple of things that I would that I would check and see if that makes it any better for you. Okay, Diane in an email said, in the past, I've read questions on Fountain Pen Network regarding cleaning the cap of a pen after changing colors. Is it possible or necessary to do this for a pilot vanishing point? If so, how would one go about checking to see if it was needed and how would it be done? Okay, so this is kind of a unique um, thing because the pilot vanishing point, you do not have a cap. It's a click pen. So it's got a mechanism in there. It's got a little trap door and the nib, when it's pushed out, the little trap door comes down, pokes out and comes back up. When you fill the pen, you actually remove the entire nib unit out of there, fill the nib unit itself, and then you install it into the pen. So you're not actually dipping the pen body itself in the ink like you would with most other fountain pens that are not a click pen. However, if you, I guess it's possible for ink to come out of that nib unit somehow, especially if you've got like a leaking issue, changing elevations, that kind of stuff. Um, I haven't heard of this being much of an issue with the vanishing point, uh, but I suppose it is possible. Um, you're asking, how would you clean it? Okay, so there's all, there's that little trap door in there. There's all kinds of little nooks and crannies in there. So the best way that I know to do it and maybe pilot has some verbiage that's better suited somewhere else. I couldn't really, couldn't really find any myself, but um, I would just basically take a little bit of water, hold the open ends of the pen and kind of shake it in there and just try to get the ink out in whatever way you can. And then maybe take a small Q-tip or something, try and get in there and swab out as much from the front nib section, the front uh, you know body portion of the pen to get as much of the ink and water out, let it dry out and then go back to using your pen. That would be my advice. Uh, but I would say, unless you suspect that there's a lot of ink in there, I wouldn't worry about doing that too often, uh, just because I don't really know what all the components are inside that pen. I imagine it's made to withstand being wet for you know a while, but I don't really know. So you may just wanna be, you know, not do that anymore than you have to, okay? Roxanne R. on Facebook said, I bought a converter with my Lamy All-Star, my first fountain pen. Congratulations. Uh, it's awesomely fantastic, but I do wonder, the converter seemed to pull up so very little ink compared to the space available to fill. Is it always this way, or is there a way to coax it to fill up more completely, or do I do something? did I do something totally wrong? I believe I kept the fill hole submerged. So yes, that is a key right there. Is the first thing is make sure that you've got the fill hole completely submerged under the water. Um, if you're not familiar with the filler hole, then you know it's it's kind of generally speaking, it's in the bottom of the feed, the part that mates up to the grip section of the pen. The feed is the back side, uh, not the shiny part of the metal nib, but on the other side. So if you've got that thing, and on the Lamy one, it's pretty easy to see. I don't have a Lamy handy, but it's pretty easy to see because it's this little square notch that's right in the pen. Uh, so make sure that that's completely submerged. But the, the general rule whenever you're filling any pen is just make sure that the whole nib is all the way in the ink to the point where the ink actually comes up onto the grip of the pen. Then there's no guesswork. You know that you've got that hole under the ink and that you're gonna fill in there. A lot of people think that fountain pens, you know, because the ink comes out of the very tip, that that's where it fills from too. That is not the case, okay? That's how it comes out through the feed with capillary action and everything, but it fills from a different part, a different hole that's in the back of the feed, generally speaking. So um, definitely make sure that you're doing that. So if you are doing that, which it sounds like you are, you are doing that, Roxanne, then I would say um, what you're experiencing is not anything unusual. Unless it's like the converter is completely empty, that might be another issue. You may have a blockage in your, in your pen or something like that, but I don't think that's what you have going on. I think what you're probably experiencing is that maybe half the converter is filling up and there's a lot of air in there. That is not unusual. And the reason that that happens is when you have a pen that's either brand new or you just recently cleaned it out and it's completely there's, it's, there's empty, there's no ink in the feed already, is you've got a bunch of air inside the converter, inside the feed. You're, move, you're moving the piston of the converter all the way down, but you've still got air all in the, in the grip of that pen. 
So as you're drawing up, excuse me, as you're drawing up, the piston's moving up in that converter. It's creating a vacuum and it's drawing ink up through that filler hole. However, there's a bunch of air that's already in the feed that's ahead of the ink that you're drawing up. So as you're unscrewing the piston inside that converter, you're gonna see air come up before ink comes up. And then there's air stuck in there. One trick that's very easy that you can do to combat that is once you fill it, expel it back out and then fill it again because you're gonna expel some of that air and then you're gonna suck more ink back up in there and you're gonna get pretty darn close to as full as it can get. Now, if you wanna get even more full, what you can actually do is remove the pen from the ink and you can expel the air out of the converter with the nib pointed up and then you can go back and fill it again and that will get you a full filling. However, doing that, you risk dribbling ink out of your pen, you risk getting little ink bubbles that will pop out of the out of the nib as you're expelling the air and it can get ink splatters everywhere. So really, if you really wanna get a full filling, you can do that. I really don't think it's worth that kind of trade off for me personally. I just, you know, screw and unscrew a couple of times in that bottle of ink to make sure I get as much ink as I reasonably can. That's the fastest way you're gonna get most of it. You're not gonna risk spilling a lot of stuff. That's what I recommend. I did do a video on this technique called getting the most ink into your fountain pens. Uh, it's from December of 2010, super old video. Uh, you know, for me, it's pretty funny to see what I was like shooting videos back then. But anyway, I did a video on that so you can always check that out. Okay, Christine D on Facebook, you said, I have a Pilot Metropolitan, love it, with the squeezy converter. You wrote love it. I didn't say love it, though I do love that pen. Anyway, Metropolitan, squeeze converter, got it. I've used it lots, but this last time, the pen was dripping ink every few days. Just a little drip. When I went to clean it, there were drops all over the inside of the barrel. Do you think there's an issue with the converter or perhaps the ink? User error? Um, the first thing I would say is make sure that that converter is pushed all the way onto the back of that pen. Um, that one, especially if you've taken it off and put it back on, um, sometimes you really need to jam that thing on there to get a full sealing. And if you don't have a full seal on the back of that thing, it can work its way loose a little bit over time. Uh, and then it can, you can get a, a dripping problem. Basically what's happening when the ink's dripping out of there is you've got too much air that's getting in there and it's not keeping a proper seal. If you think about it like, you know, if you ever go out to a restaurant or something and you have a glass of water or whatever your favorite, you know, soda is or something like that and you've got a straw. Well, you know, if you ever remember from being a kid, you would always take the straw, put your finger over the top, lift it up and the water would stay in there and then you let it go and the water would all fall out. That's the same kind of thing that's going on in your fountain pen. There's an air ink interchange that happens inside the pen and it's all engineered and everything on every pen to be the proper balance so that your pen flows properly when you go to write with it, but yet doesn't gush completely when the pen is just sitting there. So there's an, a proper air ink interchange that happens. And what happens if your converter is loose is that you are having too much air that's being allowed to get into the ink chamber area and the ink will therefore want to flow out of that pen way more than it's supposed to. So that's what I greatly suspect is happening in your situation. Okay, let's see here. Next question. This was from somebody called Vintage Flex Fountain Pens and Accessories on Facebook. I believe that's a fan page of some kind. So um, anyway, your question was, when using an older hard rubber eyedropper pen, sometimes, I'm pretty sure you mean ebonite, but maybe there's another type of rubber I'm not familiar with. Uh, sometimes there can be a slight leak where the threaded section inserts into the barrel. I found that coating the thread section with beeswax works well. Can you recommend a better solution? Um, yeah, I guess uh, beeswax could work okay. I haven't heard of that being used before. If that's what you have handy, you know, give it a shot. Generally speaking, silicone grease is what you use for that kind of thing, for any type of eyedropper conversion, mainly because silicone grease is inert. It's not gonna react with your uh, ink that you're using. I'm not sure how beeswax would do. I've other heard of other people that use Vaseline that has seemed to work okay. I'm not sure if that would react with any type of pen. I'm sure if you have any type of petroleum-based pen, there may be some kind of reaction there just because Vaseline is also petroleum-based. So I don't know if I would go messing around with that. But generally speaking, 100% pure silicone grease is gonna be your safest bet for doing eyedropper conversions. Cool. Ted on Ink Nouveau said, I carry my fountain pens in my shirt pocket, clipped with the tip up every day, but sometimes I leave them there without use for hours and they do not start so well. 
and under a rush need, this is inconvenient. Other than, that, than a design feature of a vanishing point, and other than putting them in a pocket loose and capped down, I lean over a lot and don't want pens falling out, what can you suggest that I do? Okay, so the vanishing point, first of all, you're still gonna have that nib pointing up. So I don't know that that in and of itself is going to be any different just because your, your, your vanishing point doesn't have your nib pointed down. It's still pointed up. So uh, that said, the, um, I would suspect your, you know, take a look at your ink. I don't know what ink you're using here, but it might be an ink issue. Try a couple of different inks and see if your ink, uh, the one that you're using now and having this problem, whether you can eliminate that as the variable. Maybe it's just, maybe it's the pen. Uh, or maybe it's the pen, maybe it's the ink, but if you're trying out different inks and it's only that one ink that's having the problem, I would just not use that particular ink for that purpose in that pen. Um, some inks and pens will play nicer with each other and it might just work out better that way. Um, so you'll have to do a little bit of experimentation there. Um, it also might be that you could try diluting the ink just a little bit with distilled water. That might help things as well. I actually haven't tried that myself before. That would be an interesting experiment though. If you get in the experimentation mode, try just a small volume of ink diluted a little bit, maybe 10 to 20% with distilled water if you have it handy. Or if it's just for an experimental purpose, you can use regular water, it doesn't have to be distilled. Uh, but you could try that out and see if maybe that will help. I doubt you would notice any difference in the color of the ink, but it might help to keep things flowing smoother. So that would be the first thing to try. Um, so uh, yes, and let's see here, what else, what else might work there? Um, I don't know if it's just a pen issue or I, this isn't something that I hear about happening a whole lot. Um, so it may just be that particular pen or it may be the particular ink. I would say my answer would be to just try and experiment and see what else you've got. Maybe you can get back to me, uh, post on the blog and see if that has worked out for you, okay? Uh, Angel, Angel L on Ink Nouveau said, how do I prevent muscle pain when using flex pens like the Noodler's Ahab? Is it normal for it to hurt after a while or should I invest in a better, softer flex nib pen? Um, so if it's hurting, I don't know what a while means for you. A while could mean five minutes for some people, it could mean three hours. That's really gonna depend. Um, one thing I will say is that a lot of people that use these flex pens have never used flex pens before and maybe aren't holding them properly. I think most people tend to hold their pens up too high. With the flex pens, you gotta really lower that pen angle quite a bit to get it to flex easier. So if you have the pen angled up too high, it may hurt your hand just because you are exerting more pressure than you should in order to get that nib to flex. That also said, if you're flexing and you're using more of your wrist than the whole arm while you're writing, that can also fatigue you quite a bit. Normally with fountain pens, you are um, not pressing very hard while you write, and it's, that's usually in and of itself enough reason to switch to a fountain pen as opposed to a ballpoint is because it requires less pressure and will not hurt your hand as much. But even still, if you're writing for any significant period of time, you're gonna wanna try to get in the habit of using your whole arm as opposed to just just using your hand and writing with your wrist as the pivot point, especially when you're doing flex stuff because you're pressing harder, you're really putting a lot of tension in your wrist and on your hands, and it's not gonna take very long before it is gonna start to hurt. So I, one, I would say one is to take breaks frequently. If your hand starts to hurt, don't keep on just bearing through it uh, if you can, if you have that option. You know, give yourself some rest, stretch your hand out and stuff like that. You don't wanna have any kind of lingering pain that goes on. But try doing the whole arm thing, okay? Try lowering your pen angle and see if that helps you out. Um, switching to another pen, I don't think that's the first thing that I would go and say to do. Now, of course, I'm a retailer and I would benefit from saying, yes, you should buy another flex pen from my store. No, I wouldn't go to that as a first option, especially because if you got the, the, nib, the Noodler's flex pen, that's a $20 flex pen, right? So if the next option that I know of that you have uh, that has any kind of flex to it at all would be the Platinum Cool, which is in the $40 range. And that flexibility is not any softer than what you're gonna get in the Noodler's pen. So to get really any softer, you might be able to move up to the Namiki Falcon, which is gonna be in the $140 range. 
So to go from $20 to $140, to spend that amount of money on what little variation in the softness of the flex that you would have over the Noodler's one, you know, I would say generally the Falcon is a little bit softer, but it's not gonna be night and day. So to spend that much money on a different pen without trying some of these other solutions first, that's not the first thing I would go to. So looking out for your best interest there. I always try to say, don't spend money on this, that kind of stuff unless you have to, unless you've determined that that is what's gonna make the difference for you. Okay, so hope that helps you, Angel. I hope your hand gets better, I really do. I want writing to be enjoyable for you. <laughs> Okay, um, Blue Moon on Inc. Nouveau said uh, three questions for the next Q&A, all about the Twisby. Okay, here we go. Uh, I'm interested in the medium nib. What happened in the last shipment? Everything came but that one. Well, we get what we get. Um, speci specifically with Twisby, you know, they've got a certain allotment of pens that they have, and it goes out to their retailers, and um, you know, they they pretty much have a limited shipment every time. Um, you know, I don't exactly know why, but that's just how it works out. So, um, not just with them, but with a lot of our manufacturers, you know, the fountain pen industry is pretty small. It's pretty niche. It's worldwide. You know, a lot of these really tiny uh, manufacturers are serving the entire world market, which can ebb and flow and change and stuff like that and a lot of times it's just we get what we get and we have to be thankful for whatever we have so you know sometimes we won't get an entire nib size sometimes stuff will be back ordered for a while that happens all the time and we try to talk about that stuff and disclose you know when that kind of stuff is going to be happening but the best thing to do is to sign up for the email notification that we have on our site that's why we have it there that way when we do get it in you'll know about it so uh, that's first questions <clears throat> Next one you had, you said, uh, I read on FP Geeks, an October 2013 article, that Twisby's fixing the cracking issues, and you sent me the link. Um, is the shipment that you just received and the medium I hope you'll soon get part of the ones that are fixed, or are they from the old batch? Okay, so when, um, when Twisby did the 580, they made a lot of changes to try to fix the, um, the cracking issues they had with the 540. Um, it has helped a lot. It's not like a 100% thing, but uh, I think it has helped a lot. So that said, I, if they are making any future changes, I'm not aware that anything that we're getting now has been changed. I know the 580 was changed from the 540, so I don't know anybody that has 540s anymore. They haven't been around for a while. The 580s now have been changed. The Twisby Mini was changed from the 540 design as well. So uh, I would say that you know if there is anything in the future that's gonna happen, you will let you know when we know, but I haven't been told anything about cracking issues and being changed in any of the, the newer Twisby pens. Okay, so what's the deal with Twisby? This is your third question. <laughs> what's your deal with Twi what's the deal with Twisby? What I mean by that is that people are crazy about them. If any other brand or model had issues, cracking or scratchy nib, people would avoid them like the plague. But I see comments like, "My Twisby skips and doesn't have the best ink flow, but I love it," and "My Twisby cracked, but I'm still using it until I get a new one." So what's the deal? <laughs> okay. Um, well, I think there's there's a lot of different factors here, and I'm not like you know I'm not a in the Twisby company or anything. We're a retailer here, you know, at Goulet Pens for Twisby. Um, so I'm, I'm probably privy to more stuff than what most people would be, I guess. But Twisby's pretty out, uh, out in the open about the way they operate things. I think that's part of the reason why people are such fans. Uh, Jim Wang, who, you know, basically kind of runs Twisby and, and started it, um, is uh, out there on Facebook all the time. He's on Fountain Pen Network. And I think especially when he first came out with the Twisby 530, there was a lot of talk and a lot of just very openness about the design and the, you know, the different components and stuff more than any manufacturers ever put out that I'm aware in the social media world uh, for how the pen was being developed. So I think that that created an incredibly enthusiastic crowd because if there's one thing that I know probably better than most people is that, you know, fountain pen folks love details. You love to get uh, you know, as much information, especially about details and engineering and stuff as possible, for the most part. Everybody's got different, you know, things that are important to them, but generally speaking, fountain pen people love details. So for a manufacturer to come out with so many details and make design changes and be so responsive and engaged with the community at that level, that immediately like created this love for the brand and they've kind of kept up with that. They post a lot of stuff on Facebook, they post pictures of prototypes and stuff all the time, which is both kind of good and bad because you 
find out about things like two years before they're ready to go to market, which kind of creates a demand way before you would normally want to because people would, you know, like us as a retailer, people are asking us questions about things and we don't have any more information than what's on Facebook, on Twisby's Facebook page uh, for maybe six months or a year before the pen is ready to start to come out. But that said, it does create a lot of excitement and people really appreciate having that information, which is why I think Twisby does that. Um, so other things is, you know, the pen is, you know, most of the pens they come out with are a really good value for what they are. You know, if you think about, you know, the Twisby, like the 580 or the Mini, you know, that's a $50 pen that is, you know, clear demonstrator. It's a very attractive pen, generally speaking, writes really well, has a good reputation, it's got a lot of nice features, large ink capacity, piston fill, comes with a wrench and silicone grease to be able to maintain it yourself. They're just doing a lot of things. The packaging's really nice, really attractive. So I would think, uh, I think generally speaking that um, they're doing a lot of things right in that respect. And so I think that they're a good value. Whereas, you know, other pens that might have similar features could easily be twice the price, easily, uh, probably more. So that said, I think a lot of people love them just because of how affordable they are. Uh, and then also, I think, you know, because there's not like this big flow of Twisby pens that are out there all the time, usually, you know, and I know as a retailer, we run out of stock all the time. And a lot of it's because of limited supply. Sometimes it's excess demand, sometimes it's limited supply, usually it's limited supply. So I think that right there creates a lot of demand and a lot of enthusiasm for it just because it's not as available. So it's almost a little bit of exclusivity there. I don't think that Twisby does that intentionally at all to try to falsely create demand. I I think it's just naturally what's ended up happening just just because so um, that's the kind of the best thing I have all this stuff is my opinion none of this is really uh, you know concrete or anything like that but that's just kind of what my observation of Twisby for the last couple of years um, so hopefully that that's good hopefully I didn't shoot myself in the foot with Twisby on anything I said here I try to represent as well as I can and be as honest and forthright as I can uh, I gotta walk a fine line as a retailer sometimes but you know that's kind of my opinion of what's going on I have nothing but respect for Twisby and what they do, and I know a lot of people love them. And um, the other thing I want to kind of tack on to the end of this whole Twisby conversation is, you know, Twisby for whatever issues they may have, I think a lot of people tend to publicize those issues more. Uh, and, you know, because it is, is such a socially engaging brand, I think more of their issues get publicized publicly out there on social media. So it seems worse than it really is. Uh, kind of like Noodlers is like that as well. Noodlers is very uh, talked about in the social realm. So it seems like there's a lot of issues. In reality, there's really not that much by percentage of how much is actually out there. So it, it, that gets skewed a little bit. But the thing I did want to say about Twisby is that they have uh, some of the most responsive warranty repair type stuff of any company I've ever seen. So they will take care of stuff, they'll send you parts, they'll send replacement feeds, whatever they have to do. They're really, really great about that. So whatever issues they may have with their pens, they warranty them so well. I think that's why they end up getting so much enthusiasm where people are like, oh, even if the pen skips or even if it gets cracked or whatever, they can get it taken care of quickly by Twisby and so it's not a complete loss. Does that make sense? So that said, uh, next question, no future, no hope on Ink Nouveau said, I have one more. How to use the Coeco squeeze converter. I have a new Coeco AC Sport Carbon with the converter, but I cannot get it full no matter how many times I squeeze it. Okay, so I had one around here somewhere and I must have cleared it off as I was cleaning my desk. Yes, believe it or not, I have to clean off my desk to shoot these videos because my desk does not stay this perfectly clean all the time. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I, I actually had never seen the Coeco squeeze converter until we got Coeco in last week. Uh, so it's pretty cool. It's, an, it's a little aerometric converter. I actually am going to be doing a video on the Coeco squeeze converter separately. I plan to. I never like to commit to doing a video before I've actually shot it, and I'm probably shooting myself in the foot by saying I'm gonna do a video on the squeeze converter, but 
anyway, I will get more information out there eventually about the squeeze converter, but it's a small converter. It's a very, very small converter. It's actually shorter than the Monteverde Mini converter, which is previously what a lot of people were using in the Kuwaiko converter. So um, yes, it is a squeeze thing and it is tough to get the thing full because the way that a squeeze converter works is it's got a bladder inside of there. You've got to squeeze the thing all the way to expel all the air out of there so that you can create a vacuum. And like I was talking about earlier with the Lamy with the piston one, you get air in there and that thing's got a really good seal. You can get, you know, a lot of ink in there. But even still, it's tough because you, with the squeeze one, you're just not able to expel all the air out of there. So you definitely have to squeeze it a few times with the nib down in that ink to try to expel all the air out of there. But really the best way to fill it, if you want to get it completely full, is to use an ink syringe. Okay, so you treat it just as if you were refilling an ink cartridge. You basically use the converter just as a container and you're just drawing up ink into your syringe and then you're filling in. So if you're gonna say, why would I go and buy this $2.30 or whatever it is, Coeco squeeze converter when I can just use the cartridge that comes with the pen and refill that, well, yeah, you can definitely do that. If you have an ink syringe handy or if you wanted to pick one up, you can refill the cartridge, the standard international cartridge that comes with the Coeco pen. Sure. However, the plastic that those things are made out of, they're essentially disposable. So they're not made of like the most durable plastic and, uh, you know, they will um, break eventually, you know, after five or maybe 10 fillings at the most, eventually they're gonna crack, they're gonna break and they're not gonna hold up forever. So that's why you would get the converter. It's gonna be more durable than your ink cartridge. So there you go. But look for a video on that at some point. I don't want to commit to a firm date, but it is going to happen. Um, okay, so uh, Zanchi Man on Reddit said, I'm just gonna say right here, this is an excellent medium to get questions from as well as Facebook, YouTube, Google Plus, so on and so forth. Well, thank you. That's very nice of you. Uh, <laughs> I think you were talking specifically about, you know, Reddit. Uh, so um, I kind of alluded to this last week when I talked, because basically um, what happened was Rachel posted on Reddit about the Q&A number 11, which was last week's, uh, using your fountain pens. And I actually ended up getting a lot of really good questions from Reddit. So, uh, so I think what you were saying, Zanchi Man, is that Reddit is a, a place that we should be soliciting questions from for Q&A, just like we are Facebook and YouTube and all that. Uh, and I, I completely agree with you, and we are going to be doing that moving forward. I didn't do that this, this week just because I already had a lot of questions. I wasn't trying to get a lot more because then I would just be getting a lot of questions I might not be able to answer. Uh, so moving forward, though, definitely I will be asking the Reddit crew for some good questions, too. Anyway, you did have a question. You said, here's my question. If I let an ink dry up in a pen, how can I clean the pen to ensure there isn't any dried ink left? I let mine sit for a couple of months, and though it didn't dry up completely, my pen did have a rough time trying to start writing. Well, yeah, what's happening there, especially a couple of months, that's kind of a long time, um, is some of the water is evaporated out. You've got kind of the dye concentrate that's left in there, and that dye is just not gonna flow very well. You need to reconstitute it with water. Now, technically, if you wanted to, just draw a little bit of water up into the pen, kind of shake it around, you very roughly would be able to get it back to its original form, sort of maybe. Uh, but generally, when I have a pen like that that's actually having some flow issues, or maybe you get some crusting on the nib, or in the you know the converter just gets kind of gunky and stuff because you've left the ink in there just flat out too long. It's usually best just to clean the whole pen out, clean it completely, and then put more ink in there. You know the amount of ink that you're going to save or whatever has been dried up in your pen. It's not worth trying to salvage to get it to flow properly and be the right color and all that kind of stuff because you're going to have a high amount of dye in there. It's going to completely change the color too, unless you can reconstitute it with water back to its original formulation, which is nearly impossible to do, especially once it's already in the pen. So that said, I would basically you just flush it. You know, flush it with water over and over again until it's clear. In that kind of situation, though, you may want to use something like a pen flush to try to clean out anything that's dried up in there. Me personally, I preach to a lot of people that you should clean out your pen. You know, if you're not gonna be using it for more than a month, clean it out and then store it, dry, store it dried out. Uh, I do not necessarily practice what I preach there. I'm a busy guy and I love to ink up pens, love to try new colors and stuff like that. I am notorious for 
having pens that are half full of ink or need to be cleaned out and just kind of leaving them and picking up something else. I've got kind of a large collection of pens and sometimes, you know, it's just easier to grab and ink up another pen than it is to clean out the one you've got. And I'm really bad about that. So more often than not, the cleanings that I end up doing are full on pen flushing, cleaning out old dried up ink, you know, doing all that kind of deal. So the one thing I will say, I've got a video on using the pen flush. So check out the Goulet pen flush video uh, if you want to, to see how that's done. But really it's not rocket science. You're just using water to flush out as much as you can. Then use a pen flush. That'll clean up a lot of what the water can't get and then flush it with clear water again and you should be good to go. Um, if you've got ink that's really, really dried up in there and is really stubborn and you're cleaning it and it's still coming out kind of, you know, the color of the ink and it's not coming out as crystal clear water, um, another th then, then you need to keep on cleaning it. Basically, if you've got ink that's coming out with the water, you're doing something right. You're getting the ink out of there. You just got to keep going with it until it's, it's done. I've had people that have written me before that had a pen that they found that must have been in a desk drawer for 10 years, 20 years, and it was inked up and crusty and stuff like that. And some of them had to clean it and maybe soak it for like a week or two before it finally was clean. So that's not unusual either. Um, so that's that's definitely something you can do. And one one trick that I like to do too, you know, if you're just flushing water through the pen, it can be hard to tell if there's trace amounts of ink still left in there. But if you are using a paper towel or a napkin or something and touching, after you clean it with water, you know, kind of touch the nib to the paper towel and it'll wick out, you know, water out of there. And if you've got a bright white paper towel and you've got a blue ink or something like that in there, any blue that's left in there mixed in with the water is going to show really bad on that paper towel. And that will expose whether the pen still needs to be cleaned more or not. So there you go. And uh, one thing I kind of mentioned, I'm not sure if I made it imp made it stand out enough, but um, to use uh, soaking as a method too. Now, generally speaking, I like to just soak in plain water. If you've got a pen that has any metal components in it, I wouldn't use that. I wouldn't soak that in a flush. Uh, mixture of any kind. I would just use water, uh, but just letting a pen sit in water for a while can help. Now, if you've got a pen that's made out of casein or something like that, that absorbs water, you don't want to soak it in water for a long period of time. You'll have to use your judgment. You definitely, definitely never want to soak it in any type of denatured alcohol or acetone or anything like that. You'd be amazed sometimes, but I get some people that send me email, emails and pictures and stuff of a pen that they've soaked in some kind of acetone or nail polish or something like that, and they end up with a liquefied pen because acetone will melt plastic. So want to stick away from those, but um, soaking can be a method that you use for, you know, soak it for a couple of days to get dried up ink out of there as well. <clears throat> okay. Last question I had for this week is from Song Andrew on Reddit. And your question was, is it normal for pens to write fatter lines the longer you use them? My four-year-old fine nib is writing dangerously close to a medium now, and I can't figure out any other reason than use over time. I would say yes, that is absolutely a potential, especially four years is a pretty decent amount of time. You know, if you've got a gold nib or if it's a little bit of a softer nib, it's totally legitimate that the pen could get a little um, broader over time. I've noticed that myself a little bit. I've got a uh, Pilot, my, one of my, my all-time favorite pens that I use regularly is a Pilot um, uh, Custom 74. It's got a medium nib, but Pilot's mediums are a little finer than some of the other pens. Uh, and I personally have kind of a heavy hand and I like to write really wet and broad and big and stuff like that. So I think me naturally, originally when I got the pen, it was a little fine for my taste. So I would tend to bear down a little harder than I would with maybe another pen. And so I probably have spread the tines just a little bit over time, weakened it up as I've used it pretty heavily over the last two and a half years. Um, even that's kind of a short period of time for that much uh, to have happened. But I've got a really low pen angle and, and stuff like that. So for me personally, I think that uh, I have spread the tines just a little bit to affect the writing of that particular pen. Um, so I would say, yeah, it's probably very possible that that might have happened to your pen. Um, is there any remedy for that is probably what you're thinking in your head. Uh, I don't know. You may want to talk to a nibmeister about that. You know, contact one of the nibmeisters that are out there and see if anything about that can be done. Um, there may be, you know, honestly, I'm not sure. That's an issue I haven't run into myself personally. I don't do a lot of nib tuning and stuff like that. So, um, you know, that then any of this stuff that we're talking about here, changing nib sizes and stuff, I don't really mess too much with that. Um, so, 
yes, I can kind of legitimize maybe that that might be the cause, though I can't tell you exactly what to do to fix it. So, <laughs> sorry, I'm kind of like helping you out in one respect and totally not helping you out in another respect. But anyway, uh, on that note, leaving off not speaking with expertise at all, but <laughs> uh, that's all I have for this Q&A. Uh, I'm going to be doing one next week, which is going to be on November 15th of 2013. It's going to be an open forum again. So I've got kind of this routine of having a topic and then doing an open forum where I'll just take questions about anything pen related, ink, paper, whatever. And that allows kind of just enter in general questions to get in there. So um, the themes help because it gives me specific things to get questions about. And then the open forum is nice because all the other random questions I get in the meantime, I can compile them all. And that tends to work out. I know this past ones I did a theme and then a backup theme to it. And then now I've got an open forum again. So that is kind of how I'll do it this time for November 15th. So that said, if you have any questions for me on Goulet Q&A, you can email me at GoulayQA at GoulayPens.com. You can answer on or ask the question on the thread that we will put up on Reddit. Rachel will probably put it up. She's Mrs. Goulet Pens over on Reddit. She'll probably put it up soliciting asking for general questions and you can ask you can ask them there. You can ask them on YouTube under this video. Um, you can ask on Inc. Nouveau under this video in the comments. You can ask on Twitter with the hashtag Goulet QA and you can ask on Facebook once we post soliciting for questions there. Lots of different ways that we can get your questions here. So I hope they just pour in because the more questions I have, the better I can answer them and the more information I can get out to the world. So that said, I had a good time this week. I hope you enjoyed this video as well. Thank you so much for spending time with me here today. And as always, right on.